Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. If you are trying to get pregnant, this is the episode for you. We talk about all things that can affect your fertility, top nine things in fact, from how a hormonal disbalance and irregularity can affect your cycle and whether you ovulate to lifestyle things such as diet, exercise, caffeine, alcohol, substance use, and even age. Now, if you are trying to get pregnant, make sure to check out our free download, our Preparing for Pregnancy download. It has all kinds of tips and tricks on things that you can do to give yourself the best chance at getting pregnant. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are Sarah and Alicia, two doctor moms who are creating a community rich with high quality information to support people through the journey from pregnancy to parenthood. Our goal is to empower with knowledge and decrease the anxieties during this time in our lives. We cover topics from fertility through the fourth trimester with the odd birth story sprinkled in. Come join us on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood or check us out on our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca. Some of these podcasts have been sponsored, which allows us to continue putting out free, amazing content. But don't worry, this won't affect our advice or recommendations. And we only partner with companies we know and trust or have come highly recommended to us by you, our listeners. She Found Health is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The information you hear does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions that you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any institution with which we are affiliated. Hey guys, it's Dr. Sarah and Alicia here from the She Found Motherhood podcast. Today we're going to talk about the things that can affect fertility in women or people hoping to get pregnant. Now, we've done a podcast on male fertility, and so Mm -hmm. certainly check that out. We did that with Dr. Ellen Forbes, urologist. But we're going to talk from the people who are wanting to get pregnant perspective today. So tip number one is the irregular or absent menstrual cycle. So first of all, let's talk about what's normal Mm -hmm. so we can understand what's abnormal. So a normal menstrual cycle is about 21 to 35 days. There are many things that can affect your hormones that control both ovulation, so releasing the egg, and your uterine lining, which is where implantation of your egg and placenta have to happen to have a healthy pregnancy. So we'll discuss many of these in today's podcast. Anything that affects ovulation or your uterine lining can affect your ability to get pregnant. So in terms of the menstrual cycle, we can generally separate it into three phases, follicular, ovulation, and luteal phase. So the follicular phase begins on the first day of your period and ends with ovulation. It can last anywhere from 11 to 27 days, but the average is about 14 days. During this time, hormones are released to stimulate a new follicle, or egg, to develop and ends with its release. As the follicle or egg matures, it begins to release estrogen, which results in the lining of the uterus becoming thicker and enriched with blood vessels. There is also a surge in hormones around day 12, which signals for the release of the egg or follicle and also causes an increase in testosterone and therefore sex drive. Mm -hmm. As we age, our follicular phase can become too short, not allowing enough time for the follicle to mature, which can affect fertility. We'll also discuss typical fertility rates with age later in the podcast. The next phase or ovulation is when the mature egg is released from the ovary into the fallopian tube. There's about a 24 hour window during which the egg must be fertilized for successful pregnancy to occur. After the egg is released, the cyst then closes over, the cyst in the ovary that is, Mm -hmm. and becomes what we know as the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum then produces progesterone and continues to do so if the egg is fertilized to support an early pregnancy. Progesterone stops the lining of the uterus from shedding. But if the egg is not fertilized, the corpus luteum disintegrates and stops producing that progesterone, signaling to the lining of the uterus to shed, completing the cycle and causing us to have menstrual bleeding. If the luteal phase is too short, your body doesn't create a thick enough uterine lining to support a pregnancy. If your cycles are less than 24 days and you're not getting pregnant, you should really talk to your doctor. Number two. So now that you know how your menstrual cycle works, we can kind of talk 
a little bit about the things that can go wrong that affect your fertility. Ovarian reserve is a very important piece of the puzzle. Women are born with all of the eggs that we will ever mm -hmm. have, and they decrease with time pretty quickly. Not only because they're released, but because they just degrade over time. I know, such a bummer. I know. When we are a fetus, so inside our mm -hmm. mother's bellies, we have about six to seven million eggs in our ovaries. When we're born, we only have about one million. Crazy, right? Totally crazy. By the time we hit puberty, we're down to like 300,000 eggs. And by that time we turn 40, which Dr. Sarah and I will be turning 40 in 10 years. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> By the time we're 40, we're down to about 25,000 eggs. So every month, we stimulate many eggs to grow, but only one, or sometimes two, mm -hmm. make the grade for ovulation. So as we get older, we have less eggs available to us, and as a result, less chance that one of those eggs are going to make the grade. Also, as we age, so do our eggs. So there is a chance that something mm -hmm. has gone haywire within the egg, and resulted in the change in the chromosomes or genetic material. This means that if we do get pregnant, our body is more likely to reject an embryo that is not genetically normal, resulting in an increased risk of a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Now this leads into number three, age. We know that women and people in their 30s that are hoping to become pregnant have approximately a 40%, they're 40% less fertile than women in their early 20s. And this is primarily because, like Dr. Alicia said, advancing age decreases the amount of eggs we produce. But some women are actually born with less eggs, or those eggs don't last as long as others, and so they have what we call a decreased ovarian reserve, or less eggs available overall, and have fertility issues earlier than average. You know, we know that the probability of conception is highly dependent upon maternal age, but paternal age also plays a small role, especially in, in men after 50. If you want to learn more about this, head to our podcast all about male infertility. And then number four, stress. Ah, stress. We are recording this podcast in the time of COVID. So we know people are experiencing lots of stress right now. And there actually is evidence out there that stress can impact your fertility. So there was a 12-month study done that looked at women who were starting to attempt pregnancy naturally, and they measured a salivary alpha amylase, which is an index of stress at baseline. They, they made sure they took into account what we call confounding factors. So these are other factors in life that may impact your fertility, the age of the woman, whether they consume alcohol, smoke cigarettes, etc. They found that the baseline level of alpha amylase predicted subsequent infertility, so that that was twice as likely to occur in women with the high, highest levels of alpha amylase compared with women in the lowest tertiary. So what does that mean? It means that higher levels of stress increase your risk of infertility. So what this means for us is that we need to manage our stress and ask for help. There's many things out there that can support you in managing stress, whether that be accessing cognitive behavioral therapy, having some training around coping skills, accessing group support, practicing mindfulness, relaxation techniques, and stress management. This is something that I think we don't talk about enough in day to day, you know, with our friends and families, but definitely something that we as care providers can help you with. So if you're finding that you're dealing with high levels of stress and you're trying to get pregnant, it may be impacting your fertility. And we definitely encourage you to reach out to your provider. And it's pretty amazing. I think we've all heard those stories of couples who are trying and trying to totally. get pregnant and go the infertility route and it's just not successful. And they're under a lot of stress because they desperately want to get mm -hmm. pregnant and have a child. And then they make the decision to move on and try for adoption. And then they get pregnant. And it's, I it's think fascinating. it's fascinating yeah. and we don't always know what's causing it, but I suspect a big part of it is that those stress levels really do impact our ability to ovulate and our body is not going to, our body is excellent at protecting us and protecting our future children. And so if we're under high levels of stress, even if we're ovulating, there's a chance our body just won't let that egg mm -hmm. implant. Totally. Um, so really, really important for so many things, but also for fertility is to really manage those stress levels as best you can. And like Dr. Sarah said, reach out for help. Yeah. And we have a resource that we can link in the show notes below. It's a mental health resource and there's some really great um, tips and and techniques that we've linked to in that resource for you guys to access. So now let's talk about medical conditions and how certain medical conditions can affect your fertility. 
So we know that there are certain ones such as PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. We're doing a podcast around this, so keep an eyeball out for it. But essentially the hormonal irregularities associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome stop women from ovulating, which give them irregular cycles and can increase testosterone resulting in unwanted facial hair growth, acne, and male pattern hair loss. Another hormonal issue is thyroid issues. Mm -hmm. And this is quite common. Um, Certainly the more severe thyroid issues can also impact our ability to get pregnant and maintain a pregnancy. Autoimmune disorders can also sometimes affect fertility, but definitely increase the risk of complications of pregnancy. So if you have a known autoimmune disorder, please make sure to have a preconception vision visit with your doctor or who's also knowledgeable in primary care. And again, we also have a preparing, I can't speak today, sorry team. (laughs) We have a preparing for pregnancy guide. We'll also link in the show notes Mm -hmm. below. Next up, we'll talk about pelvic disease. So, you know, sometimes when we think about all the steps that are required for a pregnancy to implant in the uterus, Sometimes I think it's crazy that errors don't happen more frequently, especially on the female side, when we think about the egg having to be released, swept up by the little fimbrae or arms at the end of the fallopian tube, travel down the tube and implant into the uterus. So thinking about this aspect of fertility and pregnancy, this is where we would talk about pelvic disease. And when we talk about pelvic disease, we're thinking about individuals who've had a history of pelvic inflammatory disease or other intra-abdominal infections, like a previous appendectomy. Um, Not appendectomy, appendicitis. Appendicitis. (laughs) Appendectomy cures the appendicitis. True, true. Um, If you've had previous pelvic surgery, if you've got a history of endometriosis, These are all conditions that can lead to tubal disease. And if your tube is diseased and had scarring in it, this can sometimes prevent the transport of the egg and sperm through the fallopian tube. There's also some uterine anomalies that can impact fertility. So uterine anomalies just mean things that are causing your uterus to be an abnormal shape. One of common cause of this is called fibroids. So uterine fibroids are just common benign smooth muscle tumors. The ones that affect fertility are particularly those that are either in the endometrial cavity or right under the mucosal lining of the endometrium. So they distort or cause an abnormal shape in the actual endometrial cavity where the pregnancy should be growing. A more rare cause would be an abnormality with the actual shape of the uterus itself. And the most common one that would impact fertility is called a septate uterus. So how do we manage pelvic disease? Well, initially, when you're, if you're having trouble conceiving, you should see your care provider, and they'll start by ordering some blood tests, as well as basic investigations like an ultrasound. An ultrasound can help assess the size and shape of your uterus, and then some providers may go on to order a test called a hysterosalpingogram, which is a very long word, where basically they pass fluid through your cervix to see if it'll flush out your tubes and into your abdomen. So when you're thinking about fertility and pelvic disease, it's important to know and to share your personal history with your provider. So this will help us understand with what might be contributing to your fertility problems. Another thing that's important to mention around pelvic disease is sometimes it's not the distortion of the uterus that is causing the problem, but actually the inflammation Mm -hmm. that is going on with a fibroid or Mm -hmm. with some other tubular disease that's actually impacting your ability to get pregnant. So... There's different options for treatment, but it's, it's really important to talk with an expert around what their opinion is, um, because that might be different than what you see on the World Wide Web, or even yes. from what Dr. Sarah and I know about, because yep. these experts in fertility and some of our amazing gynecologists really have a much more in-depth knowledge around that. So really important to kind of really talk to those providers before you do anything drastic. Mm-hmm. You know it. Next up, an important thing that can affect fertility is not understanding the importance of timing your intercourse. So if you're trying to get pregnant, you really need to time your intercourse or insemination for your fertile window. And so like Dr. Alicia talked about, we know the cycle is broken down into the follicular, the ovulatory, and the luteal phase. So your fertile window is generally considered the five days leading up to ovulation and the day of ovulation itself. So it's really important to know when you ovulate, as the unfertilized oocyte, or the egg, typically only survives for around 24 hours unfertilized, while sperm can actually survive for up to three to five days inside your cervical mucus. 
If you're wanting to know tips and tricks on how to find your fertile window, we have the YouTube video for you. We have a whole YouTube video dedicated to this, and we'll link it in the show notes below. Next up, we'll talk about substances. So when we talk about substances, today we'll just touch on the ones that are commonly consumed, including alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. Honestly, Alicia, this could be a whole podcast on its own, but we'll do a quick overview of the most common substances used in our areas. I'm pretty sure we did do an entire podcast on marijuana. Marijuana. So go check that out if you want to know more about it. Yes, we did. Um, So use of tobacco by the female partner and possibly by the male partner has been associated with subfertility. And the research says it might account for as much as 13% of infertility. They think this happens in smokers because it can cause tubal changes. So um, the the egg can't travel as easily down the fallopian tube and it might cause damage to the developing embryo as well. It also might increase the risk of spontaneous abortion or miscarriage and increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy. In terms of alcohol, we think that, you know, m- mild to moderate alcohol consumption, <clears throat> which is less than two drinks a day, or moderate would be anywhere from three to 13 drinks a day, probably has no or minimal adverse effects on fertility, but higher levels of alcohol consumption should probably be avoided when attempting pregnancy. We know that moderate and heavy drinkers, so people drinking more than 14 drinks, tend to take longer to achieve pregnancy, and they are at higher risk of having to undergo an infertility evaluation. We also know that heavy alcohol use by the male partner is related to abnormalities in gonadal function, which means that their uh, testicles their gonads. Yep, are not producing sperm um, as we would expect. And this can cause reduced, this can be impacted by reduced testosterone impotence. So inability to achieve and sustain erection and also decreased spermatogenesis, just meaning they're not making as much sperm as they should be. And lastly, we'll briefly touch on cannabis and fertility. Um, And so when it comes to male infertility, we know that um, a lot of studies have shown THC, so the the psychoactive component of cannabis, to reduce um, male hormone, impact the male hormone cycle, so the HPO axis, reduce sperm motility, the ability of sperm to fertilize, sperm count, serum testosterone levels, serum luteinizing hormone levels, which is a hormone that impacts male fertility. And generally, sperm count has been found to be reduced by almost 30% in individuals who use cannabis once a week or more. That was a lot of fancy words that you just used. It was, wasn't it? Essentially. Cannabis impacts male fertility. Yes. (laughs) Uh, In terms of female fertility, we know that when you're consuming what we call exogenous cannabis, so smoked or ingested, it causes um, a delay in ovulation. And often we see longer increased anovulatory cycles, which means that you're having months where you actually are not ovulating. It can also impact your menstrual cycle and it can prolong your follicular phase. So that beginning stage of your menstrual cycle, delay ovulation, and then cause a shorter luteal phase, which may impact the ability for your body to continue to carry the pregnancy. Yeah. So remember how we talked about that in the first tip, a shortened luteal phase means Mm -hmm. that your body does not have enough time to create a lining that is sufficient for an egg to implant on. Exactly. Now, we often hear when we post these things on Instagram or um, other places that People respond saying, no, that's not true. I got pregnant. And again, some people who use this amount of alcohol, who use this amount of substances or smoke, get they get pregnant. That's great. That's really great for you. Yeah. But if you are struggling with infertility and you are using excessive amounts of substances, smoking, marijuana, alcohol, just have a good look at that and see if you can decrease your use. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself might help your fertility journey. Absolutely. So the last but certainly not least Mm -hmm. is lifestyle. So lifestyle is a catch-all phrase for diet, exercise, and general well-being, some of which we'd already talked about, aka the stress discussion we Mm -hmm. have. But let's first talk about kind of weight. So obese over a BMI body mass index of over 30 um, and underweight women are at a risk of subfertility as well as other adverse effects on their health. So an elevated or BMI or obesity is often associated with dysfunction in how you ovulate. So irregular menstrual cycles, lack of ovulation, and even in regularly ovulating women, increasing obesity appears to be associated with a decreasing risk of spontaneous pregnancy rates, and it increases the risk in the 
It increases the time it takes to achieve pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this seems to be about when your BMI is 27 or greater. So we're not entirely sure about this, but we think the mechanism is that it's related to the insulin resistance and leading to increased insulin. So we've talked about that in other podcasts. You can check out our gestational diabetes podcast mm -hmm. or a PCOS podcast if you want to understand a little bit more around how your insulin levels can affect your fertility. Mm -hmm. We also know that obesity associated hyperleptinemia may be an additional factor involved in anovulation not only through the induction of insulin resistance, so causing the insulin resistance, but also through impairment of the way that your function normally... Um, ovary. Oh, your ovary normally functions. <laughs> I know, it's a lot, hey? Um, and then when we're talking about underweight, we're generally talking about a BMI of less than 17. And so we know that um, women who are underweight, and so particularly those who exercise excessively and or have a really low caloric intake, may have what we call hypothalamic amenorrhea, meaning that they're, the normal complex hormonal cycle loop that we go through every month is interrupted because of low caloric intake and low fat mass. And again, our bodies are smart mm -hmm. and they are meant to help us survive as a, as a human race. And so mm -hmm. if our bodies and our ovaries and our uteruses don't think that we would be able to sustain a pregnancy, then they don't... Yeah work as they should and so that's where these mechanisms also come in it's a protective mechanism on ourselves on our bodies yeah. and our future children if we are not as healthy as we can be going into pregnancy absolutely let's let's talk about exercise so believe it or not and i feel like we should be saying this with a caveat but female fertility can actually be affected by increased intensity and duration of exercise so for this women for this reason for a woman you know, with what we would classify as a normal BMI, so anything under 25, who are attempting to conceive, we generally recommend limiting vigorous exercise to fewer than five hours per week. Now, unfortunately, male fertility does not appear to be affected by exercise, which is a total kick in the pants. But, you know, it's important to take this into consideration. And we would we would refer to strenuous activity, things like, you know, long distance or sprint running, gymnastics, fast cycling aerobics, these types of activities. And again, we're saying, we're not saying don't do them, just limit them to five hours a week or If fewer. you're struggling with fertility. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and they think this could be re um, related to reduced progesterone production during your luteal phase, like Dr. Alicia talked about. Um, alterations in that very complex hormonal cycle from your brain to your ovary and back again, um, which ultimately results in what we call anovulation or a lack of ovulation and changes in leptin levels, which we also talked about briefly when we were talking about obesity. Now, this is really complex stuff, but people love talking about hormones, so we're putting it out there. And please remember from a population perspective, inadequate levels of exercise are associated with obesity, and that is probably a more common cause of anovulation and subsequent infertility than exercise-induced anovulation. So let's chat quickly about our favorite beverage, coffee, of which we are both drinking right now. <laughs> Sarah's sucking it back. I am. Um, so female fertility does not appear to be affected mm. by caffeine intake less than 200 milligrams a day, even for women undergoing IVF therapy. There is no strong evidence to support limiting caffeine intake in the male partner. I mean, let's be reasonable. Let's not drink eight to 10 cups exactly. of coffee because your heart yeah. is going to go pitter, pitter, patter. But a reasonable amount, a couple of cups of coffee a day is totally fine in both partners. Generally speaking, it's thought that for the female partner, um, women contemplating pregnancy probably can have one to two, six to eight ounce cups of coffee per day without negatively impacting their ability to conceive or their baby once they are pregnant. Mm -hmm. So if you love your coffee... Go for it. Also helps with constipation early on. Right? Yeah. So there you have it. Those are our top reasons that can affect fertility. We know that was, again, a big whirlwind. And if you're not experiencing infertility, then take all of this as you want. Mm -hmm, exactly. I think the main caveat is be as healthy as you can. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's just, it's important to know that so many things can impact fertility and all just optimize your health and well-being 
right? That's the most important thing you can do moving forward. And and ask for help early. And if you don't feel supported by your care provider, then, you know, ask for help from someone else. Totally. Well, we hope you have a great day. We hope you stay healthy. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.